Hello and welcome to the webinar on using air-propelled abrasive grits for weed management in organic grain and vegetable crops. This is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. Before we begin, I'd like to give you a quick overview of how today's webinar will work. The presentation will last about 45 minutes, and after that, we'll have an additional 30 minutes for your questions. We'll be reading the questions out loud after the presentation is over, and we'll answer as many as we have time for. Today's webinar will provide an introduction to the concept of weed management with air-propelled abrasive grits, or weed blasting, in organic cropping systems. We're very glad to be hosting some of the team members of the newly funded NIFA OREI project, Sam Wortman, Sharon Clay, and Dan Humber. Dr. Sam Wortman is an assistant professor in the Department of Crop Sciences at the University of Illinois. He studies urban and local food production, and the goal of his research is to develop cropping systems and cultural practices that maximize productivity and profitability with minimal environmental impact. Dr. Sharon Clay is a weed scientist at South Dakota State University. Over her career, she's worked in many aspects of weed biology and weed control, including cover crops, resistant weeds, biocontrol, and crop weed interactions. Dr. Daniel Humberg is an agriculture engineer and professor in the Department of Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering at South Dakota State University. He has 23 years of experience teaching engineering design of agricultural machines and oversaw the design and fabrication of the first abrasive weed control system to be mounted on a tractor. So with that, I will be handing the presentation over to our first speaker, Sam Wortman. Thanks, Alice. My name is Sam Wortman, and i um, collaborating with uh, Frank Forcella, Sharon Clay, Dan Umberg, and Mohamed Babadoust on this uh, NIFA OREI project. Um, unfortunately, Frank uh, can't be with us today because he is actually in Spain uh, giving um, a presentation to folks at a university there on, on the same topic. So, um, so he won't be able to join us. And then Mohamed Babadoust is a pathologist, uh, plant pathologist at the University of Illinois that uh, is working on the project, and I'll talk more about his role later on in the presentation. So an overview of what we'll uh, go over in today's webinar. Uh, I'm going to start out by giving you a brief history of this project and kind of some of the initial research that led to our current project. And then I'm going to pass it over to Dan, and he's going to talk about um, applicator and nozzle designs, some of the things that they've already done and what they will be doing over the next few years. Then he's going to pass it along to Sharon, and she'll talk about applications, uh, grid applications in grain crops, and that they've been some of the work they've been doing in South Dakota and Minnesota. And then uh, I'll take over from there and talk about uh, grid applications, uh, specifically in organic vegetable crops. And then I'll talk about some of the future directions and where this project will be headed over the next few years. So I'm sure it's no surprise to anybody on the webinar today that weeds are consistently listed by farmers as one of their top management concerns. Um, one of the primary reasons for this is because it's one of the most yield limiting factors in organic cropping systems. There's also concerns that uh, so certain weed species can be um, vectors of diseases and insect pests that can limit the not only the yield but also the quality of crops, which is important in fruits and vegetables. And then there's also concerns about managing the weed seed bank uh, because just one season of poor weed control uh, can replenish the weed seed bank and cause problems for 5, 10, or 20 years to come. There are uh, some OMRI listed uh, certified organic herbicides but to be used in organic cropping systems, but they're typically not very cost effective and they're more appropriate for spot spraying to control, for example, noxious weeds like Canada thistle but they're not as effective for broadcast applications or even banded applications within the crop row for season-long weed control. Um, hand weeding is very expensive and difficult to source uh, and is backbreaking, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right there. We've all, we've all been there. If you work in organic cropping systems and go home at the end of the day with a sore lower back, and uh, so our goal as researchers is to try and find ways that we can avoid this painful situation 
of having to do a lot of hand weeding um, at the end of the towards the end of the the growing season, and consequently, organic farmers uh, rely quite a bit on tillage, um, both um, to prepare the seed bed and then also inner row tillage, and uh, some methods for uh, in row weed control as well. And the the challenge that we have in organic weed management is that there isn't there aren't any silver bullets. Uh, so you can think about in conventional cropping systems, there are often um, what we call a big hammer. So uh, you might think about Roundup or glyphosate as a, a big herbicide hammer that controls a very uh, wide range of weeds at different phases within um, conventional cropping systems. In organic weed management, if you use that hammer analogy, instead of one big hammer, we need to find many little hammers that in aggregate can provide the same level of season-long weed control that we get from one big hammer in uh, Roundup, for example. And so in organic cropping systems, we use things like cover crops and crop rotation and different tillage strategies, but it's oftentimes uh, we still find that weeds escape the crosshairs of those strategies. And so in this picture in the bottom, I've got um, one of our uh, fields at in one of our organic production systems at the University of Illinois at our sustainable student farm and you can see we've got some tomatoes there uh, in a plastic culture system where we uh, previously used cover crops and crop rotation and some um, seed seed bed preparation um, but we still have quite a few broadleaf and grass weeds that are uh, emerging through the the crop holes of that plastic culture system and so even in an intensive vegetable production system, we still struggle with weeds. And so uh, our team believes that weed blasting or abrasive uh, grit weed management may serve as a really valuable little hammer in one of these diversified uh, organic weed management strategies. And so the, the general concept of uh, weed blasting is that we take air, uh, compressed air and deliver uh, any type of gritty material um, to abrade weedy stem and leaf tissue. And so we deliver these grits, the air um, is compressed to about 100 pounds per square inch, 100 PSI, and we spray the, the weeds and we destroy the apical meristem and dicots when the growing point is above the soil surface and grasses when the growing point is beneath the soil surface. Um, we can uh, slow the growth of the weed, but um, typically we're not uh, able to induce as much mortality because that growing point is protected beneath the soil surface. One key aspect of this technology is that we have, we do need to have a significant height differential between the crop and the weed, and so we still want to be planting or transplanting our crops into a clean seedbed. Uh, and we want time for that uh, crop seedling to establish and develop that competitive advantage over the weeds. And then once those that first flush of weeds starts to germinate, we can come in and apply our abrasive grits um, at, uh, aimed at the, the base of that uh, crop. So we are spraying towards the base of the crop and getting um, a little bit of stem tissue damage, and we'll talk more about that in the presentation, but as long as we have that height differential, we find that we can get acceptable levels of weed suppression. So uh, Frank's not here today, but I have to give him a lot of the credit. He um, is kind of the pioneer in all of this work. Uh, Frank is with USDA ARS in Minnesota, and he started doing some of this work around 2008. And he first published, I believe this was the first paper he published in the top left here, um, kind of a proof of concept paper showing that he could use air propelled abrasive uh, grits. He was using uh, granulated walnut shells and corn cob grits to begin with. And he showed that he could get uh, almost 100% mortality of common lambs quarters using this technology. And he did this work in the greenhouse. Then he moved out into the field, started doing some in-row weed control in field corn and um, that citations and weed technology. And then uh, he also expanded then beyond corn cob grit and demonstrated the potential for granulated corn gluten meal, so uh, an approved OMRI listed organic fertilizer to provide the same function. And then uh, there's been some additional work um, at South Dakota State um, by Sharon Clay and her graduate student um, to show that uh, they could combine these intra-row grit applications with inter-row weed management through tillage or, or flaming to provide season-long weed control, and she'll talk more about uh, that research later in this webinar.
So after uh, Frank's initial work, uh, the next stage was to scale up the technology. So Frank and Sharon and Dan put together um, a North Central Region SARE grant that they were awarded um, a few years ago. And the goal of that project was to develop uh, a multi-row grid applicator. And so Dan and one of his uh, engineering students designed this beautiful machine here at the bottom of uh, my slide. Uh, it is a, a four-row applicator uh, with two nozzles, so you're coming at uh, the crop row from both sides. Um, it's got a PTO-driven air compressor and uh, grit hoppers, and um, Dan will talk more about um, the development of that and some of the nozzle technology that, that goes with that during his section of the webinar. And so I've been following uh, Frank and Sharon and Dan's work closely um, since about 2011 when I saw Frank give a, a talk on this at the Weed Science meetings. And um, he identified a few challenges uh, despite all of their successes that they'd been having with this developing this technology. And one of the challenges that was yet to be worked out was, you know, how, how much grit can we apply to make this economically feasible? Which crops do we need to uh, be focusing on to make it economically feasible? And um, just in terms of logistics of how much grit would have to be sourced and transported to the farm or produced on the farm and applied on a large scale. So there was some concern about the scalability, for example, in uh, to maybe a 500 or 1,000 acre grain crop farm. And uh, so that's where I got really interested in this technology because I focus on uh, primarily fruit and vegetable crops and more small scale production systems, local food systems, uh, so somewhere in that maybe one to ten acre uh, production system range. And uh, I also got very interested in this concept that Frank demonstrated with corn gluten meal of using organic fertilizers um, so that we could maybe um, kill two birds with one stone and supplement our, our crop nutrition while also controlling weeds uh, in the crop row. And so um, published this study in weed technology last year um, demonstrating that we could use different organic fertilizers to control a wide range of weeds and uh, with minimal impact on the overall health and growth of tomatoes and peppers. And so that took us to uh, our the submission of our uh, proposal to USDA NIFA OREI program, which we were fortunate enough to receive funding for. And through that project, we partnered with eOrganic and um, to develop webinars like we're presenting today. So we're just in year one of this project, so our goal today is to kind of provide an overview of how we got here and the work that we plan to do over the next three to four years. Um, we'll also be partnering with, partnering with eOrganic to develop YouTube videos uh, so that we can demonstrate this technology in the field, um, which is really important for this type of um, tactic. And then we'll be developing uh, some articles as well. And so with that, I will pass uh, the baton over to Dan to talk about some of the applicator design and uh, nozzle design that's gone on to this point. Thanks, Sam. Um, Sam showed you pictures of the first machine that was developed uh, um, pretty much from the ideas that Frank Frisella uh, did first in the laboratory and then in, in the field with hand-operated machines. Uh, Frank wrote that SARE grant and then came to us and asked us if we could design uh, or wrote into the grant that the people at SDSU would design a four-row machine and his idea was that we would have a machine for doing uh, plot scale work and also cooperator work. Uh, his target crop for this was corn and so we were in the upper Midwest, corn is grown on primarily on 30 inch row centers. And so we developed a machine that while it's adjustable, uh, it would accommodate four 30 inch rows. In this case, the machine has eight nozzles on the picture to the left. You can see the eight uh, yellow nozzles at the back of the machine. There is a large screw comp air compressor in the center. And that's a power takeoff driven compressor, probably uses on the order of 30 horsepower. Uh, when it's running at capacity and it does take that kind of uh, air to, to be able to operate these eight nozzles. Um, there are two grit bins here. Uh, we, we didn't set up to this as a machine to test different grits so there are not multiple uh, grit tanks on there to be able to quickly switch grits. That's something we're trying to build into the newer machine now or the next generation machine. Uh, but this one had two tanks 
um, that would store a fairly large volume of, of grit and we were using, uh, well, we, we started the design anyway using ground corn cob as the material, the grit material, and that's what Frank had some experience with and suggested we design for. Um, each of these bins has a metering, a rotary meter on the bottom of it that uh, we can control with a DC motor and speed control. We can control on this one the left four nozzles and the meter for those four and then the right four nozzles and so we can do essentially two rows or four rows. Um, you can't control individual nozzles but you can control them in those sets of four. The image at the right shows across that back toolbar the, the nozzles and those are adjustable right now so that because we didn't know what angles would be most efficacy or most efficient for the um, for the treatment of small weeds in corn. So we designed it so that they could point the nozzles pretty much any direction and angle that they wanted to. And uh, I don't, I, I haven't done the studies. I suspect that uh, Sharon and Frank have worked some to try to determine which orientations of nozzles are more effective than others. And we learned a lot from this machine. Uh, it was designed primarily by one graduate student. You'll see his name later in the presentation, but it was Corey Lanou who was the student, exceptional student that designed the, this machine and did a lot of work on the trying to optimize the uh, speed of the air, leaving the, the nozzles in the on the system itself. And so we could make optimum use of the air from that, that um, compressor. Let's see, let's go on to the next slide and and um, uh, that that machine is is, is in use, uh, continues to be used. Uh, the grant that we're working under now, that uh, Sam primarily wrote, but we've all been involved in, uh, involves a different form of machine. Um, and so here we have a, a list of the objectives or criteria that we're trying to achieve for that newer machine, because it's it's targeting a different type of crop, uh, a, a crop that's uh, more vegetable or fruit oriented, and and not necessarily so much of a commodity crop like corn is, where the production practices are fairly standardized. Uh, this one maybe has to be a little bit more flexible. We are going to a trailer design where the last design was carried um, fully mounted. Um, as a three-point hitch implement. Um, that one works um, and uh, if you have very straight rows and a very careful operator, um, he's able to keep the nozzles zeroed in on the row where they need to be. But the kill zone, I guess I would call it for these nozzles, is a relatively small band where the, uh, where the crop is emerging or where the crop is planted. And so any deviation from that uh, targeting can can cause you to kill weeds that are not in the row with the corn. And what we found with that machine was when I watched it operate and watched different operators uh, operate it, that steering the tractor in the front of the tractor shifts the front of the tractor over and it shifts the very back part of the three-point hitch mounted machine in the opposite direction. So it's not too hard to get off of the row. Plus the even, even if the operator is careful, the three-point hitch has a little bit of sway in it, left to right sway. And so it's it's it can be difficult to keep the um, nozzles optimally centered on the row. So this the new one we're going to do is a is a trailer design, probably minimize that lateral sway that we would see. Um, it'll be adaptable to different row practices for different cooperators or different crops that Sam might be testing it in. We're making this one a self-contained self -contained system. We're not going to drive it with a power takeoff because we do want to have lots of air available. And so we may be in that, we could be in that 25 or 30 horsepower range for the, the power required to run the air compressor. And not all the small tractors we might want to connect it to would have that much power takeoff uh, power available. So this one's going to, has a self-contained air compressor on it. Uh, we're designing the system to have multiple bins on the back so that for research purposes um, it's possible to, to easily switch from one grit to another grit so that if Sam um, wants to test different grit products uh, it's very easy to do that and they don't take a lot of time unloading bins. Um, in this one we're setting it up although you don't see any nozzles on the, the drawing of this one yet. We're going to set it up, the students are planning to set it up so that early in the season they could operate two nozzles on one side of the machine and 
hit both sides of a row that's a small crop yet and then later in the in the season as a crop like tomatoes might be trellised they would have to pull off one of those or disconnect one of those nozzles and treat that same row from individually from both sides so that a single nozzle could be used to approach it from one side of the trellised crop then we, we may also build in a single hand nozzle so that Sam can use that as, as he sees necessary in the research plots or whatever to uh, test things or to clean up a little bit. Um, we may uh, also experiment with some alternate grit types in, in, the, in what we're doing in terms of the efficacy of our nozzles themselves. The drawing you see at the, on this case, in this case is an early um, SOLIDWORKS drawing of the machine as the students have laid out. It, their current design looks a lot like this, but it, it's, that's still in the formative stages. One of the things that we decided to do was that in order to try and speed the process of getting this machine done so that we could get the maximum use and time out of it in the, in, within the grant was to rather than have one graduate student take on the design of a machine like this, I have capstone design students that are undergraduate engineers. Uh, and so I have currently have five of them working on this because there actually are quite a few different parts of the design that that uh, need solutions worked out for them. And so we're dividing it up and doing it this way. And so we hope to have a machine by the end of April that we can begin to test in the field. They actually have a conclusion to their uh, capstone design that is pretty much the end of April. And so they need to have their project finished. A large part of the, the uh, process of making this successful really comes down to the nozzle that, that we uh, use. And we have s specific goals for those nozzles. Um, obviously, we want to achieve a high exit velocity of the grit. The faster the grit is moving, the more uh, abrasive it is or the more damaging it is to the seedling weeds. And so we want to try and keep the grit velocity as high as we possibly can. Uh, it's the, since it's the air that's achieving that velocity, you really need to get a high velocity in the air uh, available from the, as that nozzle discharges that air. Um, and we'll come back to that in the next slide. But we also would like to be able to manage the grit application pattern. One of the things that Frank kind of requested as we kicked around this grant and this idea was that we perhaps look at alternate nozzle geometries to the first one that we developed so we might be able to control the pattern somewhat like a sprayer uh, a chemical sprayer has a, a flat fan pattern or a cone pattern or a, uh, whatever pattern um, that we might be able to design nozzles that would provide a pattern so they could test different geometries to see which ones work best. We wanted the system to be able to be reliable and trouble free uh, so that it's it, if we're going to use it for um, uh, cooperator projects or demonstration projects that it works effectively and doesn't require a lot of uh, specialized training or um, or be troublesome in some aspects of it. And we'll talk about some of those with the nozzles coming up too. Um, we'd also like to allow for uh, relatively inexperiment, inexpensive experimentation with uh, component design. Really what we're talking about is these nozzles. Again, uh, we're looking at methods to make them that might be less expensive than the first, uh, than it was to make the first set. I want to very briefly talk about uh, nozzle types for blasting purposes. Uh, this this graphic is a little bit different than what I first developed, and it's and it's not perfect here, but it'll illustrate the concept nonetheless. If you were to go to the hardware store and buy an, an air com or a sandblaster, uh, depending on how much you're willing to spend, this is the kind of a nozzle that you're likely to get. Uh, it uses brings in compressed air, and then in one way or another, there are several probably different ways of doing it, but there is a way to siphon the grit into that airstream to pull it in uh, and then, that, then entrain it with the air. And then the last step is before it's discharged is that it's forced to go down through uh, a cone into a very small discharge point. And the, the air accelerates as it has to go down, go, it has to go faster and faster for the same amount of air to get through that very small hole. And so the air accelerates and you get your highest air speeds right at the discharge of that nozzle. Uh, ideally, you'd also bring the grit along with the air since that's what's propelling the grit and we would we would accelerate the grit to a speed that's generally not as high as the air but almost as high as the air. And this type of a siphon uh, type nozzle will actually give you uh, the, the um, excuse me, I just just stepped out of my uh, 
presentation. Alice, can you tell me how I click that box to minimize the control box and I'm, I've lost it here. Can you tell me how to get that back? Unmuted. Hi, I just had to unmute myself. Yeah, there should be a little flower icon at the bottom of your computer. It kind of looks like a blue or yellow flower. And if you just click oh, on that, there we go. it come back. All right. <laughs> I'm back, thanks. All right. I won't touch that button again. <laughs> um, anyway, Muted. Um, the one of the, the challenges that Sam has noted with this type of nozzle is that he's using different grits and siphoning it out of a bucket, but that it's very prone to plugging the nozzle. Uh, if your grit isn't extremely uniform in size, and if it's if it's maybe just a little bit large relative to the size of that discharge at the end of the nozzle, it's pretty easy to plug it. And once you plug it, you you have to stop and uh, disconnect things and disassemble them, perhaps, and and clean it out and start over again. And so when we first started the first uh, grit blaster machine, we had to consider how are we going to entrain the grit in the airstream. And so we, this is, is a common system, but it is not the system that we ultimately decided to use. And I'm going to go on to the next slide here. Um, it, it, this, this siphon type nozzle does do a good job of getting a very high grit velocities because they, they pretty much approach the air velocity as you're exiting the nozzle. And this feeding is a simple con in concept, but maintaining an actual uh, a controlled flow of grit in there may be uh, a little bit more of a challenge. Uh, disadvantages, again, feeding might not be as easily controlled, and then it can tend to plug that orifice, which is a troublesome thing. And, we don't, and particularly if we ever get to a production machine, you don't have to worry about plugging nozzles and having to stop and, and clear them regularly. Another potential issue is that the nozzle itself now is exposed to the high-speed grit. And, and depending on how abrasive that grit is, it will wear the nozzle orifice itself out relatively quickly. And as that nozzle orifice wears, it changes the air velocities that you get and, the, and can move quickly away from the optimum velocities that you might have designed into that as the, the nozzle gets orifice gets larger, the air velocity goes down. And we would also find then that you probably end up replacing tips on a fairly regular basis in order to combat that issue of nozzle wear. So the system that we had developed for the first machine and that we're pursuing a variant of this on the second machine as well is what, uh, what Corey, the other graduate student, called the pen cage nozzle design. And in this case, that, that means that uh, the design of the throat system for the air uh, is designed to handle air only, but it's designed to optimize that part of the system. Uh, that orifice is then is designed with a, a, a cone where the, the air accelerates and then an expansion cone as it goes through the actual small orifice that limits the airflow uh, to get the maximum possible expansion of that air as it's coming out of that, uh, that nozzle and reach the highest velocity that it can. Um, without without causing any kind of a shock wave in that in the exhaust part of it, which then turns around and limits the amount of air that we can put through it and how fast we can make it go. So this nozzle is designed to achieve full expansion of that compressed air for the maximum velocity that we can get out of it. And so Corey developed a model that allows us to size that based on the amount of airflow that we want to put through. Essentially, it makes it easy, easier to design that thing for a, a specific machine to know that you're going to get the maximum air velocity that you can when the air exits the nozzle. But the air doesn't have any grit in it at that point. And so then we, we have to entrain the grit in that high-speed airstream after it's exited the, the actual air nozzle itself. You can see uh, in this slide, you can see on the right, um, there's an actual graphic of the, of the nozzle that accelerates our air. And then there's a cross section of it, like a machine drawing below that shows one of the iterations of the development of that. And this is what I, what uh, Corey Lanou designed was what he called the perfectly expanded nozzle. And that, that's where the pen term comes from. Uh, in this case, he designed the nozzle to be optimized at 100 pound per square inch uh, air pressure behind it. And it accelerates the air to, it can achieve, it actually achieves sonic velocities as it goes through that little throat. But then as it expands coming out of there, it'll go to supersonic velocities. And he could reach a velocity of about, I think it was like 2.3 Mach uh, coming out of that nozzle. Um, it uses high pressure, low velocity air entering and, and then exits at very, very high velocity. Um, 
the ORI system that we're developing right now will be optimized at a somewhat higher air pressure than that because we do have a little bit more air pressure available with the compressor we're buying right now and we don't have as many nozzles to serve so we're, we're going to try and push it a little bit harder on these nozzles. The next step then is to have to entrain the grit into that airstream and if you look on the left of the drawing down below you'll see the actual uh, cone the, the, and uh, where the air goes into and then comes out of that small expansion cone and then it enters this uh, device that Corey called the cage which stood for constant area grit entrainment um, and the, the parts that he worked on the design of and are, are on the interior of that, the exterior parts uh, are pretty much were just a matter of manufacturing issues but you'll see that there's a, there's a blue arrow in there that represents the air stream going down that straight bore and then there's a a red arrow coming in and that's our grit being and pulled in through a, a side uh, tube where we're, we've metered grit and we're actually pushing the grit with a sl small volume of air in that side tube. What's maybe not as obvious is that behind that tube and just after our air discharges into this is there are a set of openings that actually open to the atmosphere so that our, our air pressure has dropped to atmospheric pressure at this point but that light blue arrow represents a very high speed jet of air going down that line. Uh, that current system then draws grit and some air in through that side opening um, and, and propels that grit or accelerates it down this tube. Um, and then this, this actual thing that he called the cage, the constant area grit entrainment uh, section, clamps onto the nose of the perfectly expanded nozzle and that's the existing machine that that uh, eight nozzle four row machine uses this kind of a, a method to accelerate that grit. Now we do not get the velocity of the grit here that we would get if we were pushing the grit through the nozzle itself but we don't wear that nozzle out either and so we're kind of trying to, we think this is probably the more practical solution for a long term machine. We have some areas of that we want to try and improve that system. Um, the constant area that Corey designed in, into this prevents any kind of back pressure or a sufficient back pressure that it would cause us to limit the velocity uh, coming out of that uh, the bore of the actual air discharge nozzle. Um, and if you do that, you, you, if you don't do that, you can get shock waves in there that are kind of like sonic little sonic booms that limit what comes out of there and limit the performance of the air nozzle. But there are things that we haven't optimized on this system as well. Corey chose a diameter that seemed logical there, but we haven't really done any theoretical modeling to say what is the appropriate size of the bore of that tube where we're accelerating the grit. And so we haven't, we really didn't experiment with a lot of different versions of that. Those vents where we're allowing air uh, in to, to go to atmospheric pressure have not been optimized. We don't know what would happen if we made them smaller. We don't know what would happen if we made them bigger. Uh, and it could be now that the bore could change shape or section when it goes down there, down left to right, but probably by maintaining a constant area of the cross-sectional area that we wouldn't change the air velocity going down there, but we could perhaps spread the grid out into a fan pattern, And but we have never yet uh, designed or developed a nozzle to try to do that. So those are one of the things that we will probably study in the, in the uh, design that we're developing right now. I think this is my last slide here, but the, the, one of the things that we're also looking at is alternate fabrication techniques for these uh, experimental devices. Uh, when we do something out of, of steel, the way we did last time, it has good durability, but it's uh, sometimes difficult to, to make, uh, to, to manufacture. Uh, the existing co constant area grit entrainment system is machined from steel and has a brass inlet sections in it and I actually I fabricated much of those those parts and I it's not something that we want to test a whole lot of different versions of because it's kind of tedious to make. What we're looking at is the possibility of 3D printing plastic versions of this and that is something that where the interior geometry can be designed and, and made very very easily uh, and relatively quickly. They probably won't be durable as a, as a durable field machine but they could be used to test different nozzle designs and find out what works best, what, what makes a different for, difference for us. Uh, and so we're looking forward to testing some of those. Now that may not be tested on the machine that gets used this next, this next summer but it could be developed in the, re, in the remainder of the grant and, and we could come up with some improved nozzles. <laughs>
So it's much easier to do the complex internal and external geometry that, that lends itself to this kind of experimentation. And it's also easier to design it to accommodate the fittings and stuff to make it more practical. And I am told now that if we can 3D print it in plastic, uh, it can also be 3D printed into a stainless steel product or a, or a, uh, a bronze product eventually. They might not be cheap nozzles, but they would at least be durable for uh, test purposes and for uh, cooperator tests. Well, that's the that's the end of the section on the, the current design of the machine or the current iteration of it. We hope to have something like this finished by, like I said, the end of April and hopefully be able to test some of it this summer in the field. Uh, I think uh, the next present part of the presentation will be given by Sharon Clay. Thanks, Dan. Yep. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've worked out with this uh, PAGMAN. Um, and some of the results that we were looking at. The graduate student is uh, Mauricio Rosario Baratis, um, and Sam had his abstract from last year up on that one of those first slides. And then Claire Fredrickson also was another uh, undergraduate student who worked on this during the summer. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about was uh, problems with uh, sway on this machine and you can't go too fast and that was one of the problems and you had to have a driver that's very very accurate and very uh, good and the rows had to be very very straight and we wish we would have put some sway bars on there or something to keep it a little bit um, straighter. Uh, the other thing that that we found was that the metering, Dan talked a little bit about the metering in the of the grid itself and we found that when if the metering wasn't quite right, we got pulsing of grit and um, some problems with that, and we had to go in a couple different times and, and change that around. The other thing is that the grit is very abrasive, and it became very difficult to measure how much grit came out of a, one of those um, nozzles. Corey did a really good job of having that grit come out because we could blow holes and bags and tarps in about 10 seconds when we were trying to, to uh, capture the, the amount of grit. And so it was uh, very interesting. Uh, the other thing is that we did have um, uh, some plugging of the nozzles, even though it looks like we shouldn't, um, there, there was times. So that grit has to be sieved and uh, done so that it's a, a pretty uniform type. So let's go ahead here. Um, did you give me the, so I can move my, um, can I go on to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, and so what we wanted to do was look at some field testing um, using these strategies. And what we looked at was um, examine the weed control uh, and with corn silage uh, for weed control and corn silage, and we also used a grain crop of corn. Um, and we looked at weed blasting in combination with flame weeding and cultivation. One of the things that Sam mentioned was that we need to have the apical meristem above the soil. Um, and so we were looking at when can we put the timing, what types of timing should we have um, for these grid applications. Is once enough? Do we need to do it twice? Do we need to do it in combination? And also we know that because we're looking at um, these nozzles and we're coming really close to the row, we understand that there's going to be uh, mid-row, inter-row weeds and when we wanted to control those as well. And so we looked at different grit timings with at the V1 stage of corn, so very small. V3 and V5. Then we also did double grid applications at V1 plus V3, V1 plus V5, or V3 plus V5. And then we also did a triple grid application, not knowing if if we needed to or not, but we looked at the at three applications at V1, V3, and V5. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the grits were applied at a rate of about 385 pounds per acre, which is fairly high. We could probably get 
lower than that, but this is what we were using. Um, we were going very slowly because of the sway on the tractor, and we didn't want to. We wanted to minimize uh, the amount of corn that we were taking out with these grits. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so did we have weed pressure in these fields? You can see that uh, our season long, we had a season long weedy check, and you can see how weedy it was. Um, we also put, a, we also had a hand weeded check, which was not perfect, but um, we went through and hand weeded at V1, V3, and V5 as well. Um, you can see at the bottom there, on the bottom left hand side, it was treated at V3. We still have some weeds present there, but you can see the grit along the bottom. Um, and then that, that's the yellow. And then if you look at the treated at V1 plus V3, um, we have fewer weeds in that inner row area. We do have weeds um, between the rows, but at the row we have very fewer weeds. And we'll take a look and see what happens with our yield and our weed, weed uh, management. So next slide. So this is what it looked like when we um, came at the end of the season. You can see that, yes, we had lots of weed pressure. Um, a lot of it was Kenopodium album, the common lamb's quarters, and we also had uh, some of the pig weeds and some grass weeds in our season long check. Next slide, please. This is our hand weeded check, so we did a nice job of keeping it clean. That probably took about three or four undergrads as well as the graduate student to work on some of that hand weeding. Next slide, please. This is what it looked like when we did the corn cob grit. It's not absolutely perfect, but we have the corn cob grit in um, towards the row and then uh, between the rows at V5. So the weeds were fairly good size when we put in the either the cultivation or the flaming, the, it was at V5 of corn, and so the weeds were a little bit bigger, and we didn't get complete control, but it looks a lot better than what it looked like when we didn't have any weed control at all. So next slide, please. This is a corn cob grit post uh, cultivation. Again, you can see that the weeds in between the rows are, are fairly uh, well controlled um, within the row. It looks like we still have some weeds, but again, this, these weeds were much smaller, um, and we'll ta take a look at what our yields were next. Next slide. Okay, so here's, um, this is in a silage type corn. It was an early season grid application, and what happened that this was at V1, it reduced our weed biomass by 71% compared to our non-weeded uh, checks and increased our yield by about 40% relative to our weedy checks. And so you can see that our single application, um, the V1 did the best with uh, a fairly good increase in yield of 40%. Our V3, we had about 29% yield um, gain over our hand, our season long weedy check. Our V1 plus V3. We, did, we also did very, very well with that. The problem when we came in at V5 is that the weeds were already present and well established. So the V3 and the V3 plus V5 application, um, the weeds were well established and we needed to get at them earlier than we did. Um, although if you look at our season long reduction in our, from our weedy check, um, you can see that we still have some weeds present. We had about 700 pounds per acre, that's 700 pounds per acre, of weed biomass compared to the 2,600 pounds of weed biomass in our season-long weedy check. Um, and you can compare that to our hand-weeded check where we still had some weeds. But you can see that when we had it at V1, we had a 71% reduction. At V3, it gave us a, a, a really good reduction of, uh, or a, not a, quite as good, at 54%. At V5, you can see that we had really good control, but it didn't help our yield any. And the reason why is because the weeds were already present, had already um, going past the weed-free period in corn. And so even though we had really, really good control, um, it didn't help our yield any. So next slide, please. 
this is what happens when we have the flaming and cultivation. Um, we reduce the weeds in the in the inner row area, but even though we reduced our ye weeds in the inner row area, it did not really help our um, yield at all because it was done at V5 and so it was later. But if we needed to control the weeds so they're not going to seed, um, we probably need to do something in that inner row area. Um, and this is what the two different treatments that we had. So the inner row biomass was about 1,500 uh, pounds per acre. And you can see that um, by doing either flaming or cultivation, we could reduce the amount of weeds that were present. Next slide, please. Um, so this, these um, past slides show and demonstrate the importance of inner row weed management um, compared to the season-long weedy treatment. The blasting reduced the in-row weed biomass, that's the stuff really close to the row, by 54 to 80%. Uh, blasting at V1 or V1 plus V3 increased our corn yield by about 40%. And again, our grit application at V5 resulted in 80% in-row bi weed biomass reduction. But the weed interference by V5 permanently stunted corn growth and yield. And so, and the other thing is that if this is not a standalone technique, we do need to, we should be using some kind of inter row flaming or cultivation to reduce those weeds that are between the rows. At, that didn't have any effect on yield, but it certainly would um, help us the next year um, with our long term control. So, next slide. Um, that concludes uh, the portion that I'm going to be talking about, and I'm going to turn it back over to Sam, and he can talk to you about what they're finding out in vegetable crops. Okay. Thank you, Sharon. I'll go through quickly uh, some of these slides, and then hopefully we can save some time for questions. Um, so our results kind of confirm what Sharon and Frank have been showing in grain crops. And I'll just quickly highlight some results from a couple of studies that we did in 2013 and 2014. First in fresh market tomatoes, a plastic culture system, and then a plastic culture system in green bell pepper. And here on the bottom right hand corner, you see the, uh, the one row applicator, or I guess the handheld applicator that we were using. This is just a, a BCS tractor. Um, that we had converted into um, a small riding tractor with uh, one of these carts. Got about a almost a four foot uh, clearance on this or uh, width. This is our uh, air com gas powered air compressor and then as as Dan mentioned we are siphoning grits out of these um, buckets. So we were looking at four different uh, types of grits. We were looking at the corn cob grits and walnut shells that uh, Frank had been working on and, and Sharon's been working on in South Dakota. But then, as I mentioned, we were really interested in this concept of using um, certified organic fertilizers um, so that we could get some fertility in addition to weed suppression with each of these passes. So we looked at uh, soybean meal and then green sand fertilizer. Uh, in 2013. We didn't look at green sand in 2014 because it uh, proved not to be too effective. So we were looking at this in combination uh, with plastic. So this was polyethylene plastic. In future studies, we're going to be looking at um, biodegradable plastic mulches. Uh, so for this application, we were really looking at kind of a spot spraying type system where we were just using that handheld applicator to spray this, uh, this crop hole area, which if you have a healthy weed seed bank like we do at our sustainable student farm, um, you still get a pretty sizable um, flush of weeds that comes through each of those individual crop holes. And so it either has to be weeded by hand or uh, with another tactic like weed blasting. So into the results, we found that our overall weed density uh, was reduced by as much as 83 and 82, uh, excuse me, 83 and 60 percent of broadleaves and grasses uh, when you got up to that two to three grit application um, um, frequency. And we found that uh, we got greater suppression of broadleaves again because that apical meristem is above the soil surface, so it's more susceptible to mortality. This reduction in weed density led to a 66% reduction in overall end of season weed biomass in these uh, tomato plots. 
and sometimes the pictures uh, a lot more valuable than these figures we put together and this sums it up pretty well our untreated control is on your left there you can see quite a few broadleaf you can see some pigweed and some grasses coming through that crop hole um, to the point where it's even hard to find your tomato plant and then if you look at the right hand side that's our, I guess our more ex one of our most extreme treatments four uh, applications about one week apart of those granulated walnut shells and you can see a very uh, clean crop and a very healthy tomato plant there. So most importantly this helped us to protect yield in our uh, fresh market tomatoes so uh, we increased total tomato yield by 44 percent compared to that uh, unweeded control plot so we were getting about 17 tons per acre of fresh market tomatoes compared to about 12 in that weedy check and we the blasting treatments had no effect on the, the ratio of marketable to non-marketable uh, tomatoes that we were getting, which is important because we had, did have some concerns that the blasting would influence the overall quality of the crop by making the plant more susceptible perhaps to certain diseases because of the, um, the sc scar tissue that um, results on this, the stem of the plant after application. So now looking at our results for uh, peppers, very similar reduction in overall weed density. We had a, a much smaller weed seed bank in the field that, um, that we were working on peppers in, and so we were just starting with a much lower um, seed bank density at uh, that weedy control or zero applications, but we saw a similar reduction up to 80% uh, reduction in weed density after two applications. Uh, we saw a much greater reduction in weed biomass, again, because of the lower overall weed seed bank density. Uh, so we saw a 97% reduction in end-of-season weed biomass in pepper, so very negligible levels of weed biomass present uh, in those crop holes at the end of the season in pepper. And we saw uh, an overall increase in yield, regardless of the type of grit we used or how many times we applied it. We saw a 30% increase in pepper yield, and again, no effect on the overall quality of those peppers that we did harvest. So just a couple of things I want to point out. So I, I did allude to the fact that when we apply these grits, there's inevitably some crop damage, um, which depending on the crop that you're growing may or may not uh, be problematic. So, so far we've tested this in corn, soybean, tomatoes, and peppers. And in, in any of these trials, we haven't observed any uh, increase in disease pressure or reductions in crop quality as a result of any of our blasting treatments, despite the fact that you look at this tomato plant on the left and this pepper plant pepper plant on the right, and you see some defoliation. You see, if you look really closely on the tomato, you can see some, um, some wounding and kind of scar tissue on that stem. Um, but the plants are, are fairly resilient, and we haven't seen uh, any problems up uh, to date. But as I mentioned, one of our collaborators on this project is a plant pathologist, Mohamed Babadoust, at uh, the University of Illinois, and he's going to be uh, helping us monitor these things in the field um, and collect some data on the potential presence of pathogens in these crops over the next few years. The other thing I wanted to point out is just how important the weed growth stage is for effective control. So Sharon kind of talked about applying in, at V1, V3, or V5 in corn. And um, so on the left, where we got better weed control in peppers, not only was there a smaller weed seed bank, but we did also a better job of applying um, earlier in the season when those weeds were at the cotyledon or one leaf stage when they're much more susceptible to those abrasive grits. Compare that with um, on the right side where in tomato we were applying, we got, fell a little bit behind because of some adverse field conditions and those weeds were more like two or three leaf, which most species are still susceptible at that point, but not as susceptible as they would be at the cotyledon stage. So just now to quickly highlight where we're headed over the next few years with this research. Uh, as Dan mentioned, they're already in the process of working on that uh, two-row applicator that we can use in vegetable crops. Um, he's also working on some of the new nozzles and spray patterns um, for, these, uh, for both of our existing applicator and this new applicator. We're expanding now into uh, on-farm trials, so I'll be working with, um, with Dave Bishop at Prairie Earth Farm in Atlanta, Illinois, and Jeff Miller at Sandhill uh, Organics in Northern Illinois to test uh, this technology. Uh, we're going to be working in broccoli and kale crops. Um, we'll also be continuing our on-farm uh, trials at the Sustainable Student Farm in tomatoes and peppers. And then they'll be working on some um, certified organic corn and soybean trials in South Dakota and Minnesota. Um, 
uh, as I mentioned, one of the big emphasis uh, the big emphasis of this uh, NIFA OREI study is going to be focusing on using certified or OMRI listed uh, organic fertilizers uh, for abrasive weed management. And so we'll be looking to see what is the benefit of using those uh, fertilizer grits. And so we'll be tracking the mineralization of those grits in the soil. Um, nitrogen mineralization, they'll also be looking at potential crop uptake and influences on yield and quality of the crops that we're growing. Um, Dr. Babadus will be monitoring potential diseases in the field and then again uh, acknowledging that this is a uh, one of many little hammers in organic weed management, we'll be looking at different tactics and ways that we can integrate this uh, technology with things like biodegradable and organic mulches that are common in vegetable production, tillage and flaming that are common um, in uh, field crop production. And so looking at this um, as a tool in integrated weed management plans. And so with that, um, I've posted all of Unmuted. individual email addresses uh, on this page. So if you have specific questions, um, feel free to contact uh, any of us. Uh, I'll also be uh, trying to post regular updates of uh, the project on um, my research website, which is listed there, urbanag.cropside.illinois.edu. Um, and then I believe um, Alice uh, will facilitate some questions now. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, um, we ran a little over time, um, but we um, are planning to still have 30 minutes for questions, um, if that's okay. Um, so we'll answer as many as we have time for. So. With that, let's move on to the questions. Um, so um, is there a backpack unit that you might be developing um, similar to a weed flamer? Is that what you meant by a handheld um, model? Yeah, I think a, a backpack unit would be difficult because you do need a substantial amount of air pressure. Um, so that, that gas-powered air compressor that I showed in one of my slides um, is about as small as you could get for a field application, so it's not something that you could that you could carry, you know, just on your back. You would always need some type of a a small tractor or wagon to to at least haul the air compressor, which is about 350 pounds. Okay, um, how would you keep the trailer model centered on the rows? Uh, we looked at a at a couple different things. Um, we're going to probably be running. It, alongside a row in this, the, the first iteration of this machine. It's possible to do rows on both left and right sides, but one of the things we're finding out is that we have a lot of different production practices. And so if those rows are not uh, planted two at a time, then essentially every row is a match row or a, a, a guest row or match row. And so the spacing of those varying would be really hard to hit both sides at one time. So we're really looking at right now at treating one row on one side of us, but with the possibility of two rows if it was planted with a two row machine. One of the things that the students are designing into this one is a kind of a, a knife like shoe that will run in the ground. Um, and if, if we can convince uh, Sam or one of the other cooperators to plant uh, with a similar shoe on their planter so that it, it essentially puts down a kind of a, a little bit of a furrow or a directrix in the ground, then we would space this, uh, position this shoe to match that one and to give us a constant standoff distance from the row. That would allow us to, to repeat that path that the planter took and without having to add a, have a complex guidance system to follow that and apply the grit directly to the row. Plus, if you were going to retreat and come back, uh, let's say once a week for two weeks or three weeks with the treatment, you could come back, drop that same guidance shoe in that same directrix or furrow and and run from one end to the other with, with as long as you did a reasonable job of steering, we think that the toe, toe type machine would follow that. Um, I grew up with a machine like that where we actually used a mono rib tire that would also follow that directrix and you didn't have to steer the machine from one end to the other. That was a conventional cultivator, but same concept. Okay, um, let's see. Are you aware of any commercially successful blasters available today or is this the first um, blaster? Uh, this, as far as I know, uh, the four-row machine that we built was the the most uh, the closest thing to a commercial blaster, and that was just to, it really wasn't developed as a commercial machine, but was developed to to be able to test a machine like a field machine in plots and demonstration areas. So I, I think the answer is no. You can't go out and buy a 
a machine that's designed to do this yet. Okay. Um, let's see. How deep was the grit? Yeah, between... and I'll just add oh, to sorry. What... Yeah. Sorry, I was just going to say that I'll, I'll add to what Dan said and that, you know, one of our long-term objectives for this project is uh, to hopefully get this technology to a place where it would attract some uh, commercial interest and that, you know, maybe in five to ten years we would have a, a commercially available grit applicator for farmers to use. Okay, great. Um, let's see, how deep was the grit between the rows and um, did bugs hide and develop in the grit? The grit, um, as you could see on my my uh, slides, the grit was pretty well evenly spaced. It wasn't, it, we didn't put down a, a lot of grit. It was, you know, diverse, and so there was nothing out there to, it wasn't like we, we had a big pile of grit out there. It was pretty much like a sand blaster um, going by and, you know, not very deep at all. You could see it when you finished sharing, but it was it maybe covered a, a, a couple of percent of the soil surface or scattered around there. It, it didn't it didn't coat the surface of the soil at all. Okay. Um. Speaking of sand, um. Did you ever just use sand? Uh, Frank may have used sand. Um. I'm I. That's a question that you'd have to ask him. <laughs> you. You certainly could, and Frank has talked about that, um, and we've even tossed around the idea of, you know, you could actually, if you had a fine enough soil texture, you could actually just pull soil and sieve soil from your own farm and reapply that. Um, so it's really anything that has a fine, gritty texture um, or could be ground into a fine, gritty texture is suitable uh, for this technology. So we've been talking with different manufacturers and um, makers of different um, certified organic fertilizers and uh, they want to know if their product would be compatible with this and the answer is if it's fine and has a gritty texture chances are it will work so yeah sand and um, would certainly have potential. Sand works but it's very heavy and you, you might actually find that on a tonnage basis it might be rather expensive to have good quality sand or uniform sized sand Okay, um, let's see. As you look at options for scaling up, have you considered a front-mounted three-point hitch unit similar to a front-mounted cultivator combined with a precision farming setup? This should keep the rows straight and eliminate the driver proficiency issues. That's a good question. We, When we started this one, I, I, I gave the students the challenge that we need to make it easier to stay on the row. Um, this is the route that they ultimately went with, although we did consider uh, perhaps mounting the compressor and the system on the back of the machine, but putting a, a belly mounted, uh, front belly mounted application bar, kind of like the old fashioned belly mounted cultivators were, so that you could see the at least one of the rows, so that you could use that as a, your visual aid, and it would be easier to keep that one uh, tracked on the row. Um, so that's a possibility, but it isn't where we're going with this. this um, vegetable crop one right now that this one needs that that would generally straddle the row um, and this we can't do that with tomatoes okay um, back to sand um, we got a couple comments one comment was that um, Frank did use sand according to a listener who must have worked with him and then um, another person says on um, sand and red clay makes brick <laughs> so. okay we actually looked at the, or talked about when we started this this fall with the students about the possibility of uh, catching the grit as because a lot of it bounces at the base of the plant, bounces off the ground, and seeing if we, we might actually someday develop a system that would catch it and recycle it so that you could, if the grit is a cost of the grit was a limiting thing, you could vacuum it up right after you've applied it with another part of the machine. But that's kind of down the road. Hmm. Okay, you, sorry. Go ahead, Sharon. I was just wondering how much more, it's already a heavy unit with, with the uh, air compressor on it, and if you were vacuuming it up at the same time, it might get even heavier. Yeah, if you're pulling extra stuff up, if it's just the grit that you applied, it would stay about the same, but 
Um, okay, could you clarify what you meant by V1 and V3? Um, is that the height of the crop or the um, how many leaves it has? That's how many leaves it has. So when it, when it first emerges from the soil and you have the cotyledon, that's the VC stage, and then when it has its first true leaf, that's the V1 stage, and the V3 is the third true leaf has expanded, and you might have a couple more leaves on it. So sorry about that. Yeah, that. Um, the number of leaves on the vegetative stage of the plant. Okay. Um, let's see. Did the green, did the grit harm the weed plastic around the tomatoes and peppers? Um, this person says it would be a concern for us in permanent crops such as blueberries. Yeah, we were concerned about that as well, and we actually took measurements um, to see if the size of the crop hole. Uh, expanded over time with each application and we didn't see any change. Uh, so again that was using polyethylene plastic and in this project we're going to be looking at using some biodegradable plastics which have a lower mechanical strength and so um, so we are a little bit concerned that if you try to use this with biodegradable plastics that there might be some more um, ripping and tearing of that of that mulch but um, we'll be we'll be testing that this summer. Okay, um, what is the minimum amount um, in pounds of grit that you've had success with per acre? Um, and have you tried using shields? No, shields would be a good idea. Um, the minimum amount, again, what the way that Frank did it was that he put, he was blasting for one second, two seconds, a quarter second, and he found that as long as you're getting the grit on the on the plant, um, it, it's okay. And so we went with the fastest method we could, and it was traveling a one about a mile and a half per hour, and I think that we could probably go faster. Um, we did get good control. I think we could probably take down some of that those numbers, and we don't know exactly what the bot base numbers would be. Yeah, and then in, in vegetable crops, if if you're using it in combination with a plastic culture system, like like we were trying in tomatoes and peppers, you know, you'd probably be taking your grit applied and and cutting it in, by about 20%. Um, so instead of maybe 400 pounds per acre. You know, we were maybe looking at 80 to 100 pounds per acre is what we were putting on in those tomato and pepper systems. I think from a design standpoint, uh, Corey's work found that um, about the same mass flow rate of air and the mass flow rate of grit. So if we were pushing a certain mass flow rate of air through the nozzles, a, a similar mass flow rate of grit produced the best velocities that he saw. Uh, you could control the amount of a grid applied then, of course, by going faster or slower down the row. Okay. Um, do you think you could use um, this in the six-inch spacing for wheat? Um, I guess for this person, everything is GPS planted, so it could be pulled straight. I would... That, that was, that's an interesting um, concept. Uh, as long as your apical meristem is below the soil surface, you you may be able to do that. Um, as I would be really hesitant because you could you could really do some damage once that apical meristem is above the the ground. Um, if I was going to do that, I think I'd want shields on it so I'm not blasting at the wheat itself. I, th I think the bigger concern would be just the amount of grit that would be required if you go to a six inch spacing. So if we were doing almost 400 pounds per acre on 30 inch rows, um, you know, you'd basically be doing five times as much. So you'd be looking at almost a ton per acre of grits that would have to be applied and that could be pretty cumbersome. Good point, Sam. Thanks. Yeah, he says that it would be when the wheat was only a few inches out of the ground. Mm -hmm. Um, it would something to test. I I don't okay. know. <laughs> um, let's see. Do you have a timeline for commercialization? 
I think the short answer is no, unless Sam has something knows something that I don't know. Um, but if you know, if we develop a, this kind of research is really designed to understand the problems and the uh, potential for the for these solutions. And if we're what we learn is that it's very promising, then we may be able to interest a commercial manufacturer or a short line manufacturer in offering these machines to uh, producers that have these kinds of problems. I've I've presented this uh, the the first some results from the first one to colleagues that I know at Agco in Jackson, Minnesota, that design uh, chemical control spray control equipment, um, but I haven't had a lot of of uh, response from them. They've had their hands full with uh, conventional equipment for the last few years. Okay, well I think that's it for questions. So thanks everybody for submitting the questions and it looks like we're gonna pretty much end on time here. Um, so I would like to just say once again that you can find our many upcoming and archived webinars on organic farming and research topics um, on our website at the top link on your screen. Um, if you have a general question about organic farming that doesn't have to do specifically with this topic, um, you can feel free to use the e-extension Ask an Expert service. So I'd like to thank Sam, Sharon, and Dan for telling about this new work today. And thank you to everyone for joining us.